we are live good evening and welcome to the second lect special lecture of vigyan vidushi 2022 as you know these lectures are part of your vigyan vidushi program with a goal to bring uh, eminent women scientists to you to showcase their work as well as uh, facilitate interactions with them today's lecture will be given by professor shikha verma shikha verma is a faculty at institute of physics bhubaneswar she is an experimental condensed matter physicist working in the areas of surface nano science and nano bio interactions basically ion beam application based studies professor verma did her msc from iit kanpur and phd at sirkos university in new york usa her field of research involves fabrication and modulation of quantum dots and nanostructures on variety of surfaces like semiconductors oxides graphene bio uh, biomimetic platforms etc she looks at their optical response transport behavior biosensing and utilizing these for technologically important applications she is a well known internationally well known expert in this field she has published over 150 refereed research articles in these areas and a leading experimentalist in the country she has served on many national committees not just in the subject but also on the special schemes of government of india particularly for women in stem that is science technology engineering and mathematics presently she is the chair of the accelerator user committee of the Inter, uh, inter university accelerator center new delhi and is also a member of the governing council of iusc and if i'm not mistaken she is the first woman to have achieved this feat she is active in science outreach programs particularly for undergraduate students and is also leading the condensed matter physics gender group in india we are indeed fortunate to have her for today's program and we look forward to hearing from her her the journey surfaces to nanotechnology and nano to nano bio over to you shikha thank you vanna for very nice introduction and also to all the organizers of vigyan vidushi for giving me this opportunity Uh, it is my pleasure to talk to the participants and uh, teachers of uh, this vigyan vidushi program uh, my whole talk is uh, i will try to keep it very simple and uh, so that uh, i i think we have several young participants so it's mostly meant for that uh, so i am really impressed with this vigyan vidushi program also uh, it's a very remarkable program and i'm uh, sure it will achieve the goals that it has set out to achieve uh, so many many congratulations to all the team members so my today's talk is uh, from surfaces to nanotechnology to nano nanobio i'll introduce all these terms which i am mentioning here <coughs> so this is a very famous uh, speech and many of you may have heard about it and it is called the plenty of room at the bottom and this was given by richard feynman in 1959 much before this uh, field of nanotechnology became uh, well known or very popular so he his main question this speech is uh, available on uh, internet so i invite all of you people to go ahead and look at it but his basic question is why cannot we write the entire 24 volumes of the encyclopedia britannica on a head of a pin and if you uh, figure it out this goal requires patterning at 10 nanometer scale and now we can uh, as uh, many of you may know or if you don't know young students may not know we can achieve far better than what he uh, wanted us to achieve or he what he set out the goal in 1959 so it is <clears throat> nearly 70 years ago and this became a very important document in the history of nanotechnology so just to continue what this all nano business is about so once you measure the surface area to volume of a, whether it is a sphere or whether it is a cube you realize surface area by volume is inversely related to its dimension uh, for the case of nano cube also to one of its side so as the r diminishes as your size diminishes your surface area to volume ratio increases so once your surface area to volume increases many properties change 
and as you will go ahead and see electrical property thermal property uh, frictional property many things are dependent on surfaces and all of them show the effect uh, and as we'll go ahead we'll show how to prepare these kind of nanostructures and some of the properties which we can study and how we study them. So, so the first nanotechnology was, uh, there are signs from 1600 to 1700 AD. So these multiple colorful glasses, uh, you may have seen in pictures of, you have listed some churches in Europe, you may have seen this, that ancient stained glass makers knew that by putting varying tiny amounts of gold and silver in the glass, they could produce the red and yellow found in the glass windows. So they didn't know what they are doing, but it turns out what actually they were putting is through their mostly alchemy uh, was gold particles of various size. So if you have a gold particle of 25 nanometer, it looks red in color, which is a surprising fact for us. Uh, when it was first, uh, people came to know these sizes, for example, 50 nanometer of gold will look green and 100 nanometer is orangish in color. And similarly, this variety of silver particles. So this, if you see the sizes are different, the shapes are different, depending on the size and shape, they will produce variety of colors. And this is the beauty of these uh, glasses that without knowing actually what they are doing, they were putting these kind of uh, sizes and shapes and producing these wonderful stained glasses. So then in 1950s, uh, mostly this uh, extensive work on the, um, uh, in the field of surfaces and nanotechnology started. And one of the driving force uh, for these uh, studies is the high vacuum. Uh, as you will go ahead, you will, I will show you in these slides that now we work in ultra high vacuum, uh, which is like minus uh, 11 tor or like minus 13, something like millimeter of NG. Uh, those kind of vacuums are needed so that your surfaces remain so clean that they don't interact with the air molecules. And these clean surfaces are necessary for many studying many of these properties. So these are the various fields where interdisciplinary science is happening on surfaces and nano, nanotechnology, physics, chemistry, material science, then all the way to biochemistry, biology, medicine, informatics. And these are the various fields, all the way varying from transistors to catalysis to uh, optoelectronics to biosensors. The list is huge and all this is available on internet. So you can uh, read this uh, and uh, it is really pleasure to read some of these articles to give some idea. But most of the things that I'll talk in these, this talk is uh, something about surfaces, something about nanostructures and leading all the way to biolab interfaces of uh, nanostructures with biomolecules. So what are surfaces? Surfaces uh, will control many properties. This is the top, very top layer of the material that we are talking about, maybe few, uh, few angstrom. So nearly three angstrom or one atomic layer of the top surface. Atomic arrangements change surface properties and one can create or deposit quantum structures and nanostructures. This again, we'll see the examples as we move forward. And <clears throat> interaction of the surfaces with the uh, surfaces and atoms, molecules, biomolecules one can study. And then there are several exceptional and advanced properties. So some of the properties that we will see here, maybe photoabsorption, sensors, conducting properties, and catalytic properties. How you prepare these surfaces and nanostructures mostly fall in two categories. It can be top-down approach or it can be bottom-up approach. In top-down approach, you uh, start from uh, some bulk material and you remove some material and you end up uh, being having nanostructures. So for example, this iron beam related technique is one like that about which I will talk in this. And then there are others also. Uh, focus and beam electron lithography. And then there are bottom up approach where you add up molecules or atom and make structures. So again, I will talk one example from this batch also, how you assemble the nanostructures. So first we go to the uh, top down technique. These are uh, uh, ion accelerator in IOP and we have several in India. Uh, Professor Vandana Nanal has a very nice uh, electron facility in TIFR also. 
So we in IOP, we have a 3 MVP electron and there are various beam lines where we can get ions of various energies or and various uh, atomic number. And this is a schematic of uh, ion implantation. Uh, this is uh, one of the lines is where we can do ion implantation. Basically bombard a material with ions. That's all uh, right now we are talking about. So these are some other facilities in IOP just uh, to make you aware. So we have molecular beam epitaxy, some other molecular beam epitaxy, deposition systems, pulse laser, laser deposition. All these systems are basically used to make the structure something like this, to make surfaces, to make interfaces. These are heterostructures, one layer sitting on top of another layer. This may be of same type as the previous one, or it may be of different type. Different atom, it can have different atomic structure. It can have, you can put different atoms in different crystallography. Can make different uh, phases. All sorts of things can be done using similar kind of system. And we have variety of other things also. So now we talk something about functional surfaces and nanomaterials. How we make them and how we study. So again, uh, we talk about this. Uh, top-down approach, and we talk about ion beam irradiation and formation of some TiO2 nanostructures, which is a top-down approach. And in this, uh, I will consider two studies, photoabsorption uh, in the visible range and switching phenomena. And then we'll go to the bottom down. So first we talk about this uh, photoabsorption. So uh, this, uh, this is a very major breakthrough that electrochemical photo photolysis of water at TiO. So water, as you know, is H2O, and it can be broken down under the UV. There is no electricity applied. We are, suppose we only apply the energy. This is the UV energy onto a TiO2 in an electrochemical cell. And then you can separate out oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is evolves at the TiO2. Many people of you maybe have a chemistry background. Even in physics, we study electrochemistry. And at the platinum uh, electrode, you evolve hydrogen. So in a way, hydrogen and oxygen, once you are able to separate, you can use it for energy materials. So water can be decomposed using UV light into oxygen and hydrogen without application of external voltage. And this was a major breakthrough, as I mentioned. And these are the people who are done it. And after that, a lot of work has started in uh, using TiO2 to absorb better light. Instead of UV light, maybe visible light. Why we need UV light for TiO2 uh, is I'll go ahead and I'll tell you. And what people notice that if this, this material, electrode material, is nanomaterial, or if it has its properties changed, its surface properties are changed, it becomes a better absorber. And a better absorber will mean better evolution of these gases for energies and so on. So uh, TiO2 is a very special material. You will hear lots of work going on on oxide materials. And it is an important photocatalytic and photochemical material. It's very stable, uh, shows high catalytic activity. Uh, inexpensive, those are the properties, non-toxic. And surface states of TiO2 or surfaces of TiO2 have been shown to play central role in the photoelectrolysis of the water. And it's use, useful in solar cell, chemical sensor, photochemical cells, electronic devices. It is also a very nice biocompatible material. So I will show a few studies of uh, biocompatible nanostructures on TiO2 surfaces. So these are phases of TiO2. Uh, you may have studied in your uh, classes something about phases. Even if you have not studied, um, uh, don't worry. Uh, TiO2 has two primary phases, which are called rutile or NRTs. And by phases, we mean they have uh, some specific uh, crystalline structure. Uh, and these are the lattice constants. These lattice constant will be dependent on their uh, what phases they come. So these are the two primary phases and they are called rutile and NRTs. They have different band gap, okay? So, so this band gap, what band gap means, I will, as we go along, I will explain. So 
you may have studied that any material will have a valence band and valence band is the level up to which the electrons will be filled at room temperature and conduction band and these are the energy levels huh, in any atom and conduction band is the level and beyond which the states will be empty. So once the energy is applied, for example, if we apply some UV light to TiO2 or any material, the electrons may get excited from valence band to conduction band. And this region is called the, this energy separation is called the band gap. So once the electron is uh, excited from valence band to conduction band, this is the filled levels, these are the empty levels, this electron and hole pair will be created. This is in the presence of the light. Once this electron and hole pair is produced, they can be used for chemical reaction. For example, electron can be used for a reduction process and a hole can be used for oxidation process. And to do these process, for example, this is the, this, this production of this electron hole pair is very important in the photoelectrolysis of water also. But important thing is to keep these things separated. So two important things from this diagram are, one thing is the creation of electron hole pair for doing a catalysis or any chemistry that we want to do or interaction for energy materials or photoelectrolysis. And second thing is to keep them separated. So in the case of TiO2, this light or energy which can create this electron hole pair is in the UV range because the band gap is about 3.2 dB, which is in the UV range. And so one of the, uh, one of the activities what is going on is to create some states in this band gap so that one can do this within visible region. Visible region will be about 1.2, 1.5, mm, much smaller. It requires much smaller energy than the UV energy. And also to stop this electron hole pair recombination. And uh, why we are interested in visible light? Because uh, solar spectrum is mostly visible and UV is only 4%. So we are more interested that we can do the same work of TiO2, which gets done at UV, but we would like to do it in the visible range. So this is the uh, what one tries to do using the modification in the surfaces or by making nanostructures. And also one needs to improve the electron hole recombination. One, if one wants to increase the time. Hmm. Right now it is about 30 picosecond. So efficiency is very low and we would like to make larger. And here is where the nanostructures come into picture. So again, why nano TiO2 one wants is high surface to volume ratio. The morphology is changes and it enhances visible light absorption. And there are surface states are present, which are uh, uh, not necessarily for this uh, talk, but these are important uh, character, which brings a uh, lot of activity on the surface and can control recombination. So it increases the recombination time. So these are the various surfaces of TiO2. Again, you may have studied in your classes that um, uh, there are different uh, planes. Again, if you have not studied, don't worry too much. It's not uh, very relevant. But if you have a TiO2 material, let's assume of some specific uh, crystallographic orientation, and you hit it with ion beams, like I said, from pelletron or from ion accelerator, you get ions. This can be of some energy and some material. Okay, and you hit your material, for example, one of the faces you tiled or hit it with this, you will, what will happen? The top surface of the material will change. Depending on the energy, your bulk properties will also change. So we want to study the surface, what is happening to the surface, and we also study what is happening to the bulk. <laughs> Here, for example, you have titanium and oxygen. So these various colors in the atom represent small black one is titanium, gray ones are oxygen, this uh, white ones are also oxygen on the top layer. So these are the various, uh, so what we have done, we had a material like this, TiO2, and we hit it with the ions. And in this case, they have been hit by argon ions. Uh, this is the direction in which they have been hit. And these are the images of a, from a technique called atomic force microscope. Okay, so basically, what we are looking is at how the top surface looks like. This is the very very top surface of the. And what you are here 
So the clean surface looks something like this, but as you start putting ions, this is basically more and more ions. This is like 10 to the power 16 number of ions. This is 10 to the power 17 ions per centimeter square and so on. As you're putting more and more ions, you see the surface morphology is changing. And the scale is given here. This much is one micron, okay? So you see there's a structure happening and this structure is happening at the nano scale regimes. Here also, these, these are the crystallographic orientations which are shown. And these are actually nanostructures which are happening on the surface, okay? So, and at some stage, they become very long, long lines. And these are called ripples on the surface. Again, uh, the beauty of this thing is you are able to look at the nanostructures. In principle, you can also look at the atoms, but uh, that is using scanning tunneling microscope technique. And I will show you some images of uh, DNA which have been done using. I'm not going into these techniques right now. I'm just showing you, giving you the flavor of uh, what all kind of things uh, uh, in this area of nanotechnology and surface science people are uh, mostly doing. So important thing with ion accelerator is it's a single step process for the formation of nanostructures. You are making nanostructures just basically by having a material and bombarding it with ions. <coughs> So how ion irradiation produces these kind of nanostructures is it creates vacancies. There is some material which goes out of the uh, bulk. So, and I will show you that in the case of PiO2, the vacancies are oxygen. Oxygen atoms goes out more easily. It is called sputtered out and it leaves the vacancy when it goes out. And there is a diffusion of atoms on the surface. These two processes compete with each other and make structures like this. Nanostructures are generated due to competition between roughening and smoothing process. It's a non-linear process. And there are instabilities on the surface. And the sputtering yield is, depends on many things. So, but uh, more importantly, you have these beautiful patterns you can generate. And these have uh, many theoretical uh, uh, frameworks also, which one studies. And of course, experimentally, we study many applications also. So there is a preferential sputtering of oxygen atom, which occurs on the TiO2 surface and produces oxygen vacancies. Oxygen vacancies, oxygen goes up. Uh, there is a, one important technique. I would just like to mention it briefly because all of you may have studied in very early classes is uh, photoelectric effect. So there is a very related technique called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. In photoelectric effect, you are bombarding your uh, material with uh, photons, uh, visible uh, light. Here we bombard it with X-rays and electrons come out of the surface. And this is so the technique is called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. But very uh, big difference between photoelectric effect and this um, XPS, uh, it is also called short form is XPS, is this takes place in ultra high vacuum. As I mentioned, you need vacuum so that your surface remains clean. And this is a very, very surface sensitive technique. Although your X-rays go deep in the material, but the electrons that come out are, are coming out from just the top layer. So this technique is done in ultra high vacuum. And this is the famous uh, kinetic energy equation that given the photon energy, the kinetic energy of the electron, uh, of that electron that is coming out depends on the binding energy of the electron. And binding energy will give you information is of the labels. Uh, we were talking about the valence label and labels below, filled labels in any atom. And once you know the uh, your filled labels, information about the filled label, what is their binding energy, you know what is the atom. So it is a way of identifying what atoms are present in your material. You do XPS. This is only one of the, one of the uh, things that you find out of XPS. It's a very rich technique. But one very simple aspect which XPS is used for is for identifying what elements are present in your material. So for example, if you have a polymer in which your uh, some material like carbon is present in various oxidation states, it will show all these states. So you see here, uh, they are present in very uh, different oxidation states. So they will have a signature and then you can figure out your carbon is in which state, and you can also identify the material. And the, the no, 
Professor Sigman got Carl Sigman was given Nobel Prize for the this uh, XPS technique. It's a very powerful technique, and again, this is a technique uh, which uh, gets used in uh, all, many fields: chemistry, physics, biology, interdisciplinary material science. So these are no more only physics uh, techniques or chemistry techniques. So like I was mentioning uh, vacancy. So this is if this is an uh, TiO2 surface. And if you see one oxygen is missing from here, and this is what is called the oxygen vacancy. So when we hit the material with ions, since oxygen is a lighter material, it goes out of the surface and can leave the vacancy states like this. And this is very important factor in making the nanostructures which I showed you on the surface. And this is the XPS, which is basically uh, showing you that there is a tiny peak here on the clean one, but it becomes bigger and bigger as we put more and more ions. And this is the oxygen vacancy. So it is just saying that as, it, as we irradiate, as we put more and more ions in our material, more and more such oxygen vacancy states are getting produced. And they also cause absence of these vacancies, also called diffusion of the other atoms. And everything together produces the nanostructures of the surface. Then role of oxygen vacancy is also that they also stop the recombination. They also help in reducing the recombination. So in two ways, it helps. Ion irradiation, one, it makes nanostructures. And secondly, it, produce, it, stops the, uh, it reduces the recombination. Uh, this, uh, what this uh, um, image is telling you, what this graph is telling you, is x-axis is wavelength. So you are putting wavelengths, uh, different wavelengths on your material, light of different wavelengths on your on your material, and you are seeing how much is it is absorbing. So your y-axis is absorbing. So you will see that the for the clean material where it says pristine, that is the clean material. Your material was absorbing some lights, and this is the intensity. So mostly the absorption was in visible uh, UV region. This is between 250 and 350. This is the UV region. So it is absorbing the wavelengths in this region. But as you put more and more ions, you see their absorption properties are changing. And absorption properties are changing because now you have nanostructures on your surface. Properties of your surfaces have changed. So you can see that the light absorption is depending on what your surface is. is. And, um, and you see your UV light is also absorbing more depending on how many ions you have put. So when we are talking about the photo uh, photoelectrolysis of water, if you absorb more energy in UV light, of course, your photoelectrolysis will be better. But more importantly, now you are also able to absorb in the visible region, which is like solar light. So you don't even have to worry about UV light. You can just use your solar light and you can do these kind of studies like photoelectrolysis of water. So ion irradiation has led to formation of nanostructures and oxygen vacancy and reduced recombination. So, and what ultimately what it is doing is changing the band gap. What I showed you that separation between valence band and conduction band, that separation is changing. There are states uh, which are uh, developing in between valence band and conduction band. And due to that, your band gap is reducing. When band gap reduces, your visible uh, absorption also decreases. So now we go to the switching phenomena. Now, what is the switching? I will also just explain. So the material that we have used is again TiO2. But in this case, now we have a thin film of TiO2, which we have irradiated with Ti ions. We again get nanostructures. But this film is not uh, single phase. This had mixed anatase and butyl phase. As I mentioned, these are the two primary phases of uh, TiO2, anatase and butyl. Okay. And what we see that initially, although it is mostly anatase, but at some time it becomes butyl. And then we also see that there is a switching phenomenon. So first, let me explain how we see the phase transition. So this is XRD, uh, X-ray diffraction studies, in which we bombard with X-rays. And uh, we can see the, the profile, what phases are present. This is through uh, XRD. So you see two features here, and the both have similar height. 
One is due to NRTs and one due to data in here. This is the clean sample, clean film. But as we put more and more ions on the same TiO2, we see suddenly this peak is very small and this peak is very large. And there is a transition going on from one to the other. And now it turns out that it's mostly rutile and very little NRTs at high doses. So this shows that some kind of a phase transition has happened from the clean film to the high dose film. And this is called the phase transition. Now it was both NRTs and rutile were similar. And now we have more rutile in the film. And uh, also this phase transition has happened around one into 13, because still here they were nearly similar, but suddenly we start seeing rise. This 10 to power 13 will mean these many ions per centimeter square have been put in the TiO2 film. <coughs> Let me not get into that. Then this is just a schematic that you have a, uh, this, all this is NRTs. This is how it happens as a function of temperature. It's a beautiful slide that this is the seed, rutile seed. And as uh, this is with, has been done with the temperature, not with the ions, but there is a seed and the NRTs particles around it start to become NRTs. And they, at some point they become completely, uh, sorry, this is rutile, this is NRTs. The NRTs starts becoming part of rutile and at one point it is completely rutile. Rutile is the thermodynamically stable phase. So the moment you provide energy to NRTA space, it becomes uh, rutile. So the moment the temperature is at least, everything becomes rutile. So this is a rutile uh, uh, material, whereas all this was the NRTA material. And these are some uh, transmission electron microscope. This is also beautiful images in the sense that you can directly see samples. For example, these are thin films. This is the TiO2 of 80 nanometer sitting on uh, several layers. And uh, these layers have been put, actually we put, we start with the silicon sample on which we put uh, some nickel and gold. And these layers have been put because we want to do some kind of a uh, conductivity measurements, which I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you. Yeah. So the sample was like this. There was a silicon piece on which some nickel was deposited, then gold was deposited. Then we deposited TiO2 using one of the techniques that I showed you. And here we had done a thermal evaporation and then we bombarded for TiO2. So this is the gold and nickel, which you are seeing in the electron microscope image. For example, this is the silicon, this is nickel, gold, TiO2. And these are the various nanostructures of NRTs and uh, rutile <coughs> that I was talking about. And here also are some photo absorption and band gap measurement. And this is the band gap. We can directly measure band gap using a technique. How much is the separation between uh, conduction band and the valence band? And you see initially it is uh, somewhere here and then it decreases. So this is due to the NRTs. And after the phase transition has taken place, it comes down. So these kind of things are very easy to study and they clearly tell us that once band gap changes are happening, then also your absorption properties will change. And once absorption properties change, then your applications will change. And now we uh, just do some resistive switching, uh, switching measurements. So what we are doing in switching, I will just directly go here. So we have this kind of a structure like silicon on which gold and TiO2 is uh, sitting. So we can measure the current we can apply a voltage between, uh, because this is a metallic, our tip is metallic, platinum iridium. Uh, this is actually being done in a specific uh, setup called uh, AFM, but here that is not important. Important is this is conducting and this is conducting. We are applying a voltage and we are measuring the current. It's the IV characteristics that we are measuring. And what we, uh, this is, uh, and then uh, this material has been irradiated with ions. So what we see, once we irradiate it with 1 into 10 to the power 15 ions, what we see that the IV characteristic is something like this. What it means is at this place, current is low, and at this place, current is high. This is the x-axis is voltage, y-axis is current. So what it means is at this voltage, we have low current, so that means resistance is high. And then the current begins to increase, Although the change in voltage is very slight, but the currents begin to increase. 
and it continues to increase only after certain voltage the current so this is called a high resistance state and this is called a low resistance state because the current is high and then the whole cycle repeats itself and so this is basically a switching behavior that we are going from a high resistance state to a low resistance state and then from low resistance state to a high resistance state so this is the switching mechanism which are we are doing in tio2 films and just by putting ions in the material and ions in the material we know because they create oxygen vacancies which we have already seen because from the surface we see oxygen vacancies sputter away so these vacancies once they go away they the their their vacancies from the surface go away and create nanostructures but their vacancies is still in the bulk material and they are helping this uh, so basically here the idea is there is a high resistance state and a low resistance state and this is called bistable reversible switching behavior and how this phenomena actually helps is i showed you that there is a conducting tip on the top and the conducting gold film on the bottom and in between these oxygen vacancies which are basically positive charge and oxygen ions are negatively charged these make these uh, filaments like this between the one electrode and the other electrode so between between the gold electrode and the tip you will have these channels or filaments of the vacancies from the top to the bottom which take the current and make this low resistance state so these green are the oxygen vacancies if they make a filament between top and bottom they they can pass current and they make low resistance state and if they, we change this potential from positive to negative then these filaments break down and they make, produce the high resistance state so this is the way this high resistance and low resistance states are happening so now we move on to the dna but what i have talked about is this photo absorption and this switching phenomena and a little bit about dna uh, how these we, we how do we handle and work with dna so dna is a functional material and why we call it functional it can be used in designing some nano materials it has a programmable scaffold and it's a biocompatible and biodegradable degradable so it's environmentally friendly and it has a potential for biosensing so uh, this is a let me just this is a famous photograph uh, this is a xrd photograph of our dna uh, this actually for this xrd photo is very famous photo it's called photo 51 and was taken by rosalind franklin of this peter dna uh, but uh, unfortunately which is a long story and uh, today is not the day i think some some day when uh, why these three people got the nobel prize and she was she didn't get it although she was not uh, alive in 1962 but people feel she should the nobel prize should have been given much before 1962 because the this uh, structure of dna was solved somewhere in 52 53 so between 53 and 62 there is a long gap so anyway the long story short uh, is people who got nobel prize are called are watson crick and uh, morris siege these are the three people who got nobel prize <clears throat> so what is the model of uh, dna it is about that it has a radius of about 1 nanometer so it's a nanostructure material and uh, if uh, it is uh, dna is made up of a phosphate backbone which is negatively charged and it has four bases c g and a t um, these are nitrogenous nitrogenous bases and these are positively charged you can say and between c and g there are three hydrogen bonds and between a and t are two hydrogen bonds but more importantly is if the everything is okay there are no mutations then c always goes with g and a always goes with t in this sense it is a programmable uh, material and uh, separation there, there will be uh, separation between each base pair for example uh, c g and a t or whatever whichever there are um, these are this is called base pair each base pair separation is about 0.34 nanometer so at this i have already said 
that G and C, there are between G and C, this is guanine and cytosine, there are three hydrogen bonds. Whereas between adenine and thymine, A and E, there are two hydrogen bonds. And uh, so this DNA is a double helix, as you know, two, two of these uh, phosphate backbones are running, uh, making a helix. And depending on the temperature or some mutations, one can have zipping, unzipping. So these, some uh, defect can create unzipping of the DNA. It can make it complete unzipping and then zipping. And so this, is, this can be happen due to temperature or some defect. And what we did is we interacted with mercuric ion, these DNA molecules. And uh, why mercury is because it's highly toxic to human health, uh, contaminated by fish. Uh, this fish, uh, contaminated fish carry mercury ion. And of course, industrial sources are there and fertilizers are there, which can move it up to the machine. So we uh, started working with a circular DNA, which is a simple, uh, it has several ba base pairs, 3000 base pair. And again, if we see it in atomic force microscope, which where I said, you can see directly what the thing looks like, morphology of any material. This is how it looks like. And the diameter is about 600 nanometer. This yellow ring that you see is what is this DNA. Here also you are seeing multiple DNA in the same image. This is the, this is the low portion and this is the high portion. So, and this, this circular DNA was interacted with mercury salt. And what we saw is that instead of circle, it becomes a linear line. Okay, here also, if you see, this is after 10 millimolar of mercury concentration. So what happened? Our circular DNA, what we started with, now they have become linear DNA. Huh? Mostly linear is what we are seeing. And if you see closely, you will see that there are dots which are repeating itself and these are base pairs of DNA. Whereas here, these are mercury nanoparticles which are going and sitting in the DNA. So there are some regions which are, have not been disturbed. And there are some regions which have been disturbed when mercury interacts with the DNA, and these are those regions. And what we did is we did some XPS. And XPS, I said that you have a material which you bombard with X-rays, and whatever elements are present in the your uh, material, you will get the information about this because their binding energies will be different. So these are the three features which clean DNA will have. And these are also present after mercury was interacted. But then we saw some new features also. One, two, three. These features were not present in the clean DNA when we did the XPS of the clean DNA. So what these peaks are due to, that is the mystery. And that's what you try to solve uh, when you analyze. So after analysis, we find that this is because of the unpairing of DNA. So our these are the bases, right? A, T, G, C, and so on. So this feature is appearing because these some of these bases have broken down. They are not connected anymore. Whereas this and this is due to these kind of things. Uh, mercury has got inserted between two thymines and mercury has got inserted between thymine and C. So you can come back and ask, how do you know that this is what has happened and not something else? And for that, we have to go to theoretical calculations. These are called some DFT calculations. And... Uh, those calculations give you some idea of what is going on. And we did the same thing with the phosphorus also. As I said, phosphorus is the uh, backbone is the phosphorus. And we don't see much change. Here also there were two peaks without interaction. And after interaction with mercury also, there are two peaks. So not much change has happened in the binding energy position. Intensity may have increased, but binding energies have not changed. So there is no change in phosphorus, but among the nitrogen bases, we see some things have broken and lots of things have happened. And this is a TM image, which is basically showing you some mercury sitting in the DNA particle. So this is the theory calculations. And from these, we figured out that uh, HG is going in TT. And this is a mutation because T in principle only interacts with A, not with T directly. But once mercury has got inserted, it gets broken down, bases break down, and all sorts of unusual things start happening. So T, T, and C, and T. So these features are given to us in the XPS. This is what these new features 
RDO because lots of disturbance has happened in the nitrogen basis. And uh, again, we can do some kind of a IV characteristic. This is a spectroscopy. And uh, this is uh, nothing but basically we are changing the voltage and measuring the current, just like we did in the switching um, mm, experiments. And if it is clean DNA, then the IV characteristics look something like this. Whereas when we interact, have interacted the DNA with mercury, this characteristics change. And since the signature, once the mercury interact signature changes, so one can call it as a sensor. So our DNA is acting as a sensor of mercury. And here also we have done some uh, these uh, DFT calculations, uh, which can tell that DNA has unzipped in some regions. Unzipped means it has broken down. Nitrogen bases are not connected anymore. And unzipped regions have included mercury nanoparticles in between them. And LG is primarily interacting with nitrogen bases. And DNA acts as a sensor of mercury nanoparticles. And we see that not much is happening to the backbone. So we know that the, most of the interaction is happening to the nitrogen bases. So now the last topic. Uh, uh, how much time do I ho have, Vatan? You have 10 minutes. Okay. So this, I'll just discuss the interaction of TiO2 nanostructures with DNA. So we have already seen that we make, uh, how we make uh, TiO2 nanostructures using ion beams. We can make uh, nanostructures on the surfaces and we can interact with the DNA. Because uh, TiO2 is a biocompatible material, but what uh, we see with these ion irradiated surfaces and that they become even more biocompatible. And why it is important to make TiO2 biocompatible? That is a question you may ask. And you may know that um, all these joints in hip joints or knee joints, the material that is used is TiO2. And uh, so the, buyer, buy, uh, the better biocompatibility is important so that it interacts better with the, uh, your body uh, material and with the uh, hydroxyapatite means whatever is the material it is gelling with, good biocompatibility always helps. So TiO2 is used in bio implants and this is an image of bone cell anchoring itself to the surface of TiO2. <coughs> so uh, so function for, functioning of biosensors depend on the surface properties, for example, how good is the homogeneity, topography, toxicity, adsorption, wetting and so on. Uh, this is a lab on a chip. This is a very interesting feature. This is in market uh, several years ago. Uh, the idea is basically that a DNA, single standard DNA, not double standard, single standard is standing on, say, copper coated surface. And if uh, a blood sample is poured over this uh, gold coated surface on which single standard DNA, we know that it is a programmable device. A will always go with T and T will always go with A and so on. So if it's a completely match is there in the blood sample of a patient, then you will see that it has interacted, otherwise it will not interact. So intra interacted will tell you that th what is the gene or what is the sequence in the blood sample of the patient. Okay. So this can be used to detect the disease or anything that you want to know can be uh, achieved provided you know what is the, uh, the sequence of the DNA, single standard DNA on your surface. This is the blood sample of the patient. You put on your single standard DNA, whose sequence you already know. If they interact, then you have idea about the sequence that is available in the blood sample. This is the idea behind gene sequencing. And this is also used for sampling the blood of the patient, what disease he may have, he or she may have. High density of DNA arrays can be used for monitoring the presence of thousands of genes simultaneously, and this is called lab chip. So TiO2 surfaces are modified to enhance biocompatibility and wetting, and DNA attachment to TiO2 surface is without any functional work. We don't put anything on the surface. We just attach the DNA directly to the TiO2. And nano patterning of TiO2 surface is done, has been done again using ion irradiation just in the first case. So this is our surfaces, clean surfaces without DNA. This is clean TiO2, no ions. This is TiO2 after irradiation at for 10 minutes, and this is TiO2 
after irradiation, ion irradiation, 13 years. Ions used was argon ions, huh? and this is what the 3D sample looks like. Now we will go ahead and put DNA on that. And this is what it looks like after we put DNA on that. Okay. The more uh, one of the important things to see is that here, the, uh, if uh, this yellow region is the DNA, then you see that DNA circle is small. Here, the DNA circle looks bigger, and here it has become very big. And this DNA circle becoming bigger and bigger in, indicates that your surface is becoming more and more biocompatible because it's becoming more and more um, uh, hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means better wetting properties. The better the wetting properties, these DNA circles become bigger and bigger on the surface. And uh, these are the various uh, DNA morphologies that you can see on the surface. I'll not, not get into the details of this, but you can have cord-like structure or you can have a monolayer of DNA or you can have fractal properties depending upon your DNA concentration and something about your buffer, what material you are putting. So you can have variety of, and here in this case, you have basically a monolayer of DNA on the surface. Monolayer will mean single atomic layer, something like that. And this is basically saying the same thing that the area of these, uh, the circle diameter is increasing. It's becoming from 60 nanometer to something like 300 nanometer. So these are nanostructures. Again, we have a variety of nanostructures, but this is DNA now. This is not uh, uh, inorganic material. This is organic material you have as a single layer, and you can study their properties. And uh, this is a powerful technique with, where you can see uh, the, the small structures and you can measure them also. Okay? You can measure their diameter. And this is what is telling you. And it's telling you that it's becoming more and more better wetted surface. And then you can do XPS. And so this is before the putting DNA, you see some TI peaks. These are the our oxygen vacancies. And once you put DNA, you see there are shift, it's not lying on top of the previous. And this indicates that there is some kind of a charge transfer happening from the DNA to the surface. So all these things, information you can get that actually there is a transfer of electron from the DNA to the TIO, all those information that you can get from. And this is again some uh, molecular dynamic simulations. These are theoretical uh, calculations one can do that once you put some kind of a base, this is a DNA base, adenine, which is sitting on the TiO2, uh, then there is some kind of a charge transfer happening. So this theory and experiment go hand in hand uh, to solve many of the problems uh, in uh, our uh, business. So, so basically nitrogen centers of adenine base give negative charge to the surface and there's a charge transfer happening on the conjugation. So but this, this is, uh, uh, and this is uh, another is uh, we can also do directly these uh, contact angle measurements, which will tell you whether the surface is becoming more uh, hydrophilic, okay, better wetting properties. So, as these angle, this angle uh, of uh, contact angle uh, is changing, it is decreasing, that indicates that our surface is having better wetting properties. And these are oxygen vacancies, as I said, oxygen vacancies are increasing as we do more ion irradiation. So nano pattern surfaces in the case of TiO2, they show better wetting behavior. And we have seen it by the interaction of DNA on these surfaces and they show enhanced biocompatibility. So <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in summary, TiO2 nanostructures uh, produced by ion irradiation show enhanced photoabsorption and band gap tailoring. There is some phase transition and there is a switching phenomena. It is called resistive switching phenomena because basically we are measuring the high resistance state and low resistance state. This is, these are very important uh, nowadays uh, compared to regular flash memories that we are using. And in the case of DNA, we have studied the mercury interaction and we have seen that DNA unzips because the nitrogen bases are getting unpaired. That means basically the phenomena of unzip. And this unzipping to zipping, I'm getting some noise. There's a... Hello? Hello? Yes, Shikha, please go Oh, ahead. sorry, there was some... Yeah, sorry. Sorry for the disturbance. Yeah.
I think speaker got has got muted. muted. Uh, Shika, Shika, you are muted. Okay, thanks. thanks. Okay, okay, yeah. So, okay. So, this zipping, unzipping is a very beautiful transition with very many theoreticians also study in, in DNA uh, under many conditions. And uh, what we have seen is also a change in electronic structure as the uh, DNA interacts with mercury or with the surface. And it is behaving as a sensor of uh, nanoparticles. Uh, DNA itself acts as a sensor. And uh, TiO2 nanostructure show enhanced biocompatibility. So, so this is a beautiful phrase from, uh, sorry, from uh, Rosalind Franklin, the lady who saw this uh, XRD of DNA, that science in everyday life cannot and should not be separated. And science for me gives a partial explanation to you. Like, so these are the people who are behind this, many of my students and postdoc, and also <clears throat> uh, many groups uh, I have uh, worked with. So I especially acknowledge uh, Dr. Kanjilal, Cheney, and uh, Sanjeev Srivastava, P.V. Satya, P. Kanjilal, Santosha. These are my students. So thank you. And uh, yeah, I can answer questions, but uh, are there a few minutes? Uh, can you? Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. I would just like to uh, just uh, take two minutes, maybe. Huh? I had yeah, some yeah. slides. Yeah, uh, actually, the, just tail of two photos. One, I have already talked about this photo 51 and uh, Rosalind Franklin, because uh, this is a began with the sheep program. So I thought I will do this. So the contribution of Rosalind was not recognized during her lifetime, although this photograph was a very vital clue to the double helix. And there are a lot of uh, uh, books written that uh, uh, what is the justification and whether what she deserved. And of course, people feel that she deserved uh, much more than what she has uh, received. And then one another photo is very disconnected from this photo or from the science photo is, uh, I don't know if some of you have come across this, but this is a photograph of Catherine Switzer. She's now of the order of, I think, 70 year old or something. Uh, this is a marathon which she ran into in 1967 when women were not allowed to run. And she ran as a boy and she's being thrown out of the marathon uh, and this is what she said at that time. I knew if I quit, nobody would ever believe that women had capability to run 26 plus miles. If I quit, it would send women's sports back, way back, instead of forward. If I quit, Jack Sample. Jack Sample is this person right in the back who is trying to throw her out. And all these like him would win. My fear and humiliation turned to anger. So now, of course, marathons allow women. And today, number 261 stands for fearless in the face of adversity. So that's all what I'd like to say. So these are beautiful photographs which motivate us. So, so these are brave young women who challenged convention and fought sexism in science and everyday life. So thank you. Thank you, Shika, for a very, very wonderful talk. You covered a large canvas, I mean, starting from the surfaces and to the nano and also the DNA structure. And also these end pictures, which really so apt and so motivating. Um, just let me take a, before I read out the questions to you, let me take a moment uh, to just to say that, you know, when the students come to TIFR, we have the part on the experimental course. And there they will do some experiments. So one of the experiments they would be, some of them will be doing is the diffraction from the double helix. So okay. in a sense, a replica. Okay, okay. And uh, yes, I mean, the, some of these stories are absolutely uh, uh, fantastic. And uh, it's really a pity that the work done so much and she succumbed to cancer. So she succumbed early yes. and that was really a sad thing. So there are many questions. And so let me start by uh, the first one. Okay, the one comment by Arpita is those ancient glass paintings are really examples of nanotechnology. So interesting. But a question by Bipasha is why is the material TIO2 so important? Yeah, so what I, like I said, it's an oxide material. 
and oxide materials have this uh, interesting thing is not only TiO2 many uh, whether it is zinc oxide or cerium oxide or uh, nickel oxide many of these uh, these are only some of the things zirconium oxide they have beautiful properties because of this interplay of uh, oxygen with all these materials, they create uh, photocatalytic properties, they show absorption properties. So it is not only TiO2 and TiO2 is one of the oxide materials. Now, of course, there are perovskite materials and variety of materials which have interplay of oxygen. And uh, that's why they, have, they show very interesting properties. And TiO2 is just one of the materials. Okay, thank you. The other question is, uh... What is the physics behind the base pairing of adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine? Yeah, so it is a uh, yeah. So if you see these um, uh, molecular structures, that's what is guiding. These are the hydrogen base pairs. And this is more of a chemistry than uh, physics from what I understand. And um, so I, I don't know about physics, what you would like to know, but this is the kind of uh, uh, free energy diagrams is what one studies in the, this case. And these are the materials that are giving low binding energy positions. Okay. Um, what is the meaning of quantum chemical calculation? This is more, it's actually a DFT calculation uh, where you are uh, placing these uh, uh, material and uh, you are, and in the, okay, so what uh, in these uh, quantum chemical calculations, what you are trying to do uh, simply is trying to figure out these binding in energy positions using this uh, uh, DFT calculations in principle. So that is what is happening. So maybe some of these details when they uh, when 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 the, uh, references which are there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another question about I want to know about topography. What about topography? What you what is to topography? Know more about topography. Want to know about topography. So topography is basically the top morphology, uh, how the top surface looks like. So, for example, in the case of uh, yeah, for example, this when we say top topography, what we mean is uh, how are the hills and valley structure on this. So you can say it uh, surface morphology or so surface topography, but topography very specifically says about the how the uh, x uh, x is uh, vertical scale is going as a function of your x position height yeah. um, but, but when i was using topography it was more like morphology on the surface how it looks okay another question is which property of tio2 favors biocompatibility So again, because of uh, it's uh, these oxygen vacancies, which are anyway present on it, we can increase the number, but the, the presence that oxygen vacancies are there on the surface as it is, they do increase its wettable character. And what we are looking at, of course, the material properties as such of biocompatibility uh, TiO2 can be studied, but uh, not many oxides show this biocompatible nature, which TiO2 shows. And again, one can do research on all the kind of materials which show these good wetting properties. So, and contact angle measurement is the one of the technique people do to study these wetting properties. So, these were the typed questions, and uh, I'm sure in case there are something more, people can still type or ask. I have one quick question, not related to the science, but I think uh, uh, it will be nice, and I'm sure many of them want to know that uh, what was it that m motivated you to get into this field? Yeah, I think I wanted to be an experimentalist and uh, that is uh, the thing and uh, condensed matter and applications I think uh, always were exciting to me to study the application properties. 
So why exactly it became uh, nano science and surfaces is, uh, uh, I think the the charted course. But uh, I'm I'm pretty sure I wanted to be a uh, in the application theory was uh, uh, a little uh, uh, too uh, was yeah I was more. Uh, what is what is the word but i was more excited by the application part of the science okay. so that's what uh, i think brought me here yeah and just a few words about uh, your choice of uh, uh, science career but what science was career. COVID or what motivated what advice you will give them i think this journey is uh, I, our mentors are very important and I think I really got some good teachers in uh, my uh, MSc when I was doing my MSc from IIT Kanpur. And uh, so, yeah, they, as some teachers can demotivate, I think there are some teachers which can really motivate. And it's always good to find, have uh, some mentors and role models whom you can uh, look up to, who will guide you. And not only, of course, uh, at that point, we don't realize that in the class they motivate but as we move forward you always fall back upon them and so i think my suggestion will be if you have good mentors in your life hold on to them keep talking to them and keep getting motivated because they are very 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 important our role models yes thank you shikha for the uh, thank you words there is one more question which says what's the maximum amount of o2 that can be removed but still keep the material intact so oh, that the numbers I will not have in my hand, but uh, I, my email is there. I can also look up and you can also look up and we can uh, uh, come up. I think he's, he or she is asking about the electrolysis of yeah. this uh, water. Yeah. So that will de also depend on many parameters, for example, including the what kind of exact substrate you are using and environment. So, but I think I have to look into those numbers. Some chemistry person will be able to tell them better. <laughs> yeah, we can we can uh, look and yeah. the original paper which I have referred to here will also have those numbers, but I can also okay. go back. That's uh, Fujishima. Yeah. There's somebody asking the question. Yes. Uh, ma'am, uh, the doubt I have is that uh, when we create these nano sized material, uh, uh, the property of the material changes, but the base material remains the same. Is it like that? Yes. So oh. your uh, okay, it, it depends. So yes, when you are doing thin film, then and you have a thin film instead of a bulk, your properties of thin film will be very different than the bulk, right? But then, if you have nano okay. nano material sitting on the bulk, your properties of the nano material are very different than the bulk. Now you really want to separate out nanomaterial from the bulk, then people do all sorts of things. You can have thin film and make nanomaterial, so bulk is not there. Or you can have a powder of nanomaterial, then your bulk will not be there. And many times uh, it doesn't matter to you. You are using a technique which will only take information from the your very top surface. So it depends what is your aim, what is your application. And then you can, if you want, to isolate nanoparticles completely from your bulk, you can do that. Does okay. that answer your question? Uh, I think so. What I wanted to ask was whether the um, same material itself remains uh, as it is, even if the sizes are reduced. As in, um, if it's no, DI, uh, if, it, if it's DiO2, will we um is is it still the same compound that remains I, even if we reduce the size to nano material yes it is the same size the uh, same, same oh. material it it still have the same it, it not always but it may have the same composition although its properties are different oh, okay ma'am does that answer your question yeah. Yeah, yes ma'am but in many cases for example when we are irradiating then we are actually changing TiO2. It doesn't remain TiO2 because I'm telling you some oxygen leaves the material, right? So in that case, it will not remain exactly TiO2. Hmm. But it is a possibility, Anna, if you have TiO2 nano powders, then actually it will be TiO2, uh, but its properties will be different. It will be nano sizes, but properties will be different. Okay. 
So there is a comment in the chat box and I think that kind of represents everyone's feelings. So I would like to say that and then close that it is, the session has been very interesting and informative. And towards the end there, it was so inspiring. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank so you. From Arpita. So thank you so much, Shikha, for uh, uh, this really and wonderful evening with us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It motivates me also. Vidushi, we will have it in person. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. To to all the participants also and to organizers and especially Vandana and uh, Amol, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me for this Vidya Vidushi. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> See you all tomorrow. Yeah. Bye, Shikha. Bye, bye, bye. You can stop the streaming.